We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Ricky George. I lead the Cyber Exercise and War Game Program at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but I have the pleasure of representing the Internet Law and found Policy Foundry here today as a Class 4 Fellow and Executive Board President. Um, we have a great all-star panel here for you today to speak about cybersecurity. Um, so I'll let them kind of go down the line, introduce themselves, their organizations, and uh, responsibilities. Start with you. My name is Megan Stiefel. Uh, you can hear me, I can tell. Um, I'm the chief, sorry, I, um, too loud? All right, it's not. Oh, okay. Um, chief strategy officer at the Institute for Security and Technology. I'm also the executive director of the non-government uh, ransomware task force. IST is a 501c3, we're based on the West Coast. We work to eradicate emerging security threats associated with technology, and we do that by bridging the gap between policymakers and technologists. Thanks for having me. Jamika Green Aaron, I am the Chief Information Officer, Security Officer of Okta's Customer Identity Cloud, and I also am the Executive Sponsor to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I've been at Okta for a few years, and we represent both uh, spectrums of digital identity: the workforce, protecting our workforce, and protecting our consumer base. And he's Catherine Pambello. Um, I work for Lumen Technologies as one of the sponsors. Thanks for being here. Um, for Lumen, I am a uh, senior director of the National Security Emergency Preparedness Portfolio, and that position is within the corporate security uh, sort of environment, and it focuses on emerging and systemic threats that Lumen by itself can't fix. In, in my other day job, uh, I'm also uh, the vice chair of the Communications Sector Coordinating Council, and I work extensively with government in sort of an advisory risk management role in that sort of dimension, and do have the opportunity to work extensively with all the critical infrastructure sectors. Given that role, and since and given the topics that we're going to talk on, I'm going to take most of my comments from sort of that public-private um, perspective. So I'm Morphe Lorwin. I'm the Chief Security Officer at Mozilla. Uh, so that job is what you would expect, I'm leading the team responsible for uh, protecting the company, making sure we build secure products, and also engaging in forums like this to make sure that we're building out the good cybersecurity policy agenda as well. Awesome. Great. Um, so just to kind of give you guys a little bit of rundown on the approach for today's discussion, we're going to look back a little bit, talk about then current challenges and threats, and then look forward. Obviously, there's some things um, hot off the press at ONCD as of last week, um, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, but first, let's let's look back and, and think a little bit about some of the things that the current administration has done with regard to cybersecurity, um, you know, prior to the publication of the National Cybersecurity Strategy. Um, you know, one of those being um, the executive order in May 2021 around um, improving the nation's cybersecurity, um, which of course was published shortly after the Colonial Pipeline incident. Um, but we can also talk about the Cyberspace Sol Solarium Commission, which of course has kind of changed and morphed during this current administration. But um, I think, you know, starting with Marshall, let's get some perspectives on, you know, what has the administration been doing that you think is right? What are you thinking that they need to change? Um, just kind of a look back and your perspectives there. So with the, um, the strategy published last week, I mean, I think it's really exciting because there's really a sense of momentum right now on these issues. And I date a lot of that momentum back to, to the executive order. Um, the administration, I think, really was quite effective at stepping forward at a moment of crisis, taking advantage of that crisis moment or a series of crisis moments, really, to make a series of really smart decisions about what was going to go into that executive order. And it's worth sort of giving, giving a read to that because it's actually quite unique because very in the weeds and detailed about precise security controls, things like that, that I think were really helpful and leaned into the technical challenges here in a useful way. Things like establishing multi-factor authentication requirements, data encryption at rest, data encryption in transit, standard logging requirements, deployment of things like endpoint detection and response. Now, this stuff, to be clear, is not rocket science. These are the same things that we should expect most companies uh, to really be deploying in their network. So it's worth pausing for a moment asking why, when we had roughly like, like two decades of cyber strategies, did we miss some of these foundational components? Um, but regardless, I think that was a really quite meaningful step forward. And it's really critical context for the strategy again, because the federal government really can't push industry to do better if it doesn't sort of have its own, uh, its own house in order. And I think that's really what that executive order did. Um, and then to, to quickly comment on the Solarium Commission, what we've also seen, and I think where we've, where we've actually seen the most progress over the last two years, is in just basic institution building. So 
that's, I think, what a lot of the solarium was pushing for, was building the institutional capacity within the government, ONCD being the best example of that, but there are many others. And as a result today, I think the federal government has a lot more cybersecurity muscle than it did only two years ago. And that means that the executive order, the strategy, these aren't gonna be just documents on paper. There's actually gonna be a solid workforce capable of actually executing on these strategies and moving the ball forward, which really hasn't been the case for a long time. Great, um, Catherine, I don't know if you have perspectives from a you know, public-private partnership or um, even broader. I, I sort of um, I have sort of a long story arch, if you will. Um, I, uh, I'm old enough that I was around when they sort of did PPD 21, where they created the critical infrastructure sectors and stuff like that. And they did it at the time because they said, wow, we really rely on critical infrastructure to do our thing. That was a big aha moment. Now, in industry is going, yeah, you do. <laughs> and as I watched that evolution over time, um, clearly, just as he was speaking to some of building the institutions, the institutions um, have been built so that government who does not bake is not the bakery for the nation, is not the manufacturer for the nation, is not the water you know, producer for the nation. You know, those institutions have changed and matured and evolved. And I think that it was perhaps with the Cyber State Solarian Commission in particular, where we really sort of saw for the first time, you know, bringing industry into this because there was actually on this commission, a private industry person. Um, I would like to formally thank Tom Fanning with Southern Company in the electric sector for, for participating in that and for using his position in that commission and also as his position as a, one of the chairs of the energy sector to reach out to other sectors to go, you know, government's thinking about just does this make sense? That sort of, does this make sense? Because what government does does not necessarily make sense for industry. When the uh, executive order came out, and this is where Lumen as a, you know, a customer, you know, Lumen as a vendor to government sort of went, ah, this is what our customers are going to be needing. This is what we're going to need to be supporting. And as sort of a, an extensibility of that, you know, if our government customers have to do zero trust, well, we better be doing zero trust too. If they're doing SBOM, we're doing SBOM because we have to feed them, they have to feed us, and we needed to stand shoulder to shoulder. What I look at, and as I look at the arch, and is with the newest cybersecurity strategy, once again, I see sort of a common, common drum beat drum beat. This is not a topic that's going away. This is not going to be an issue that we as a nation can avoid, defer, or kick the can on. The environment has changed. And whereas it used to be happy, glad company, and let's go create an app and, you know, wreck a billion dollars and I'm 12 years old, you know, now, okay, be 12 years old, create an app, but what's the security on that? <laughs> you know. Um, so for me, when I look at sort of the long-term arch of it, what, I cons what I'm seeing consistently is a drumbeat towards, no, we really have to, um, you know, be much more sophisticated about these things. And it's a whole of nation and that's everybody involved. Back to you. No, that's, that's a great perspective. Thank you. And, uh, and Jamika, from your perspective at Okta, right, you know, what do you think about what's happened in the past couple of years leading up to this new national uh, cybersecurity strategy? I think what the Biden-Harris administration, which we are grateful for this, has done is highlight, and, and both of you have also highlighted the need for additional public-private partnership. Um, what we're doing uh, with this new executive order and now the strategy is taking the vision and putting it into action and actionable items and real implementation. And I think that there shouldn't be a panic around this strategy. I think that ultimately when you set the vision, you are setting the path towards the future. And that's what this administration has done. They've set the path towards the future. And the future, how that manifests is in many different ways. Right now, when we look at this space, 70% of global governments have already implemented at least one tenant of zero trust architecture. So that means they've either looked at identity, which is the first pillar. They've looked at design or device, and they've also looked at infrastructure and implementation. And they've said, we have a plan to implement at least one of these things. What the government, what our government is saying is that this is the future. Um, and so when we reinforce this with a national cyber strategy or with the FedRAM Authorization Act, which sets FedRAM into law, we are saying that we are doubling down on that drumbeat that says, yes, this is the future. Cybersecurity is important. It's not going away. Not only is it not going away, we would like to see more by design. We'd like to see secure by design. We'd like to see privacy by design. And I think that this new strategy that's out is really um, honing the path ahead. That's great. That's great. So Megan, from a civil society perspective, you know, what's the last few years been like, you know, what are your comments on 
on what the administration's done, the EO, and, and things leading up to today? You know, I think it's uh, to echo the points that some of the other panelists have made. I do agree that it's been a steady drumbeat. Um, I will take the Wayback Machine further back, uh, back to CNCI, which was the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. Some of us called it Lucky 77. Um, and there, you know, this was 2008, 2009. You really see the government starting to organize itself. Now, finally, I think this is, these strategies today are really talking about this, the need and the essential role for public-private partnerships. So we're pleased to see that. Um, you know, and so I think I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I do agree that there's a lot of um, the tempo and uh, the messaging is consistent. And so I think one of the things that hasn't been highlighted by some of the panelists is, whereas before you would see government saying you need to do all of these things, now, thanks to uh, a number of, of um, legislative successes over the past 18 months, 24 months, there is actually money behind some of those. You should do this. Um, I'm thinking in particular about some of the monies that were allocated in the infrastructure protection, uh, or excuse me, infrastructure bill rather, um, getting out to state and local entities as well as private sector actors, civil society, et cetera, to help them shore up their cybersecurity so they can do things like zero trust or have the capacity to log so that they can report incidents. Um, you know, the Solarium Commission, we mentioned a couple, but there, um, I was looking quickly because I knew this was one of the questions. Um, as of last fall, they were counting, I think, 60% uh, progress on their recommendations with uh, with um, over 25%, I think we're, so 60 plus 25, we've got 85%. Now we have the strategy, so that's another kind of uh, success that the Solarium Commission, I think, put this, put our nation on, and, and I think, the strategy sets up sets us up well. The new strategy sets us up well to continue to carry forward those objectives and really get to a, a better place. Absolutely, yeah. I think you know it's important as to look back a little bit, but then also discuss kind of what are the current challenges and threats that the administration is facing. And I think you know, in, in preparation for today's discussion, um, you know, Megan, I'd like to kick it to you to kind of set the stage on, from your perspective, what are some of those current threats and and challenges building upon, you know, what's been done in the past from a legislation perspective? Sure, I mean, I think, you know, fortunately, uh, not much has changed in some ways in the sense that we're still talking about the big four, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Um, what has changed is that they haven't slowed down, you know, the, the pace of, of particularly Chinese um, uh, activities uh, continues and continues, uh, you know, we can talk about balloons. Um, I actually live in South Carolina, a little secret, and didn't see it go down, but um, the number of, of incidents that we are visibly seeing now from China, whereas before, you know, on the Wayback Machine, we would, for when I was in government, go around telling industry, you really need to be worried about the Chinese. And people would sort of look at you like, what? Um, so they are not going away. I think what, what I hope folks are also focusing on, though, is, you know, before I get into that point, you know, what are we worried about with North Korea, right? Well, among other things, they're hacking um, cryptocurrency exchanges and the like in order to be able to um, fund their uh, WMD piece. So as we think about not only um, the security of the internet, we think about the security of digital uh, assets. And so wanting back to the create a company in, in two minutes, um, well, what's the security of your uh, exchange piece? And, as I mentioned, when I introduced myself, I do serve as the executive director of the ransomware task force. And the message really is to say ransomware has not gone away. Just because Colonial was almost two years ago, um, ransomware continues to be a major problem. The reason we don't see it as much is, is a multifold uh, set of issues. But I think among other things, we should not grow complacent both on the ransomware front, but also on uh, the scale and scope of Russian activities. Many will want to say that, look, you know, we didn't have cyber war in Ukraine. Well, let's not be naive about that. Um, a lot of credit, I think, goes to the administration for getting the Shields Up campaign going and helping industry prepare and know what was coming. Likewise, uh, a number of other industry partners have um, really worked to support the government of Ukraine and others uh, in country to help shore up and make their infrastructure more resilient. So um, not nothing uh no good news there unfortunately definitely yeah the actors are gonna stay busy as they always do um you know i don't know if you uh, from kind of marshall from your perspective as a cso kind of what are some of the current challenges or threats that you're considering today yes yeah, so i'll just say the the threat environment is still just extremely challenging and from my perspective you know we just see that on a daily basis i'm the guy that i get the call at 12 12 midnight you know and my team says hey we've got a problem um and it just keeps us jumping and moving 
constantly. Um, I think just from a defensive perspective, you know, uh, like most enterprises today are very complex and that includes Mozilla, but I think it's the, the various pieces of technology that we have integrated into our internal network and then the vectors that that creates for compromise uh, just creates a very challenging environment for us. Um, you combine that with just a diversity of threat actors, even when you're not including the potential state actors, which are the most sophisticated, which are the ones that are going to get in and have persistence. Um, so it's still very challenging. Like I spoke earlier, I think we've made some real progress at getting the defenses up, both in industry and in government, uh, but there's still more, more left to do uh, than we've done, and it's still pretty challenging. Absolutely. Um, Catherine, you spoke about you know some of the sector uh, coordinating bodies. I'd be interested to get your perspective on, in those communities, what are some of the key challenges and threats that you guys might be discussing um, amongst yourselves? What I have found, I've been doing this stuff now for a thing for about 10 years. Thank you, Lumen. Um, it's an environment where, you know, uh, I'm communication sector, you know, I'm a big ISP, I'm a global backbone, you know, and then there in my sector, at least, you know, there are small network service providers that uh, have literally, you know, 35 employees and they take care of 5,000 square miles in Montana. Okay. So it's a different sort of scale thing. So we're always trying to reconcile sort of the, we, we understand, I see philosophically what the threat is, but how do you manifest, you know, so what are you going to do about it? And there's always a lot of reconciliation even within the sector, you know, between the cable guys, the wireless guys, the wireline guys, the satellite guys, the broadcasters. What, what's our solution? What's our approach for fixing it? And then you have to add the added dimension of, you know, small versus big. Well, that's just one sector. Let's get to 16 and 18. And so while you can see the intent and you see the goals of government to reduce risk, mitigate, increase resiliency, being able to create a taxonomy so that the energy guys are doing this. And by the way, the nuclear guys are doing 1A and the you know, oil and gas are doing 1B and the electric guys are doing 1C.1 if they're generation versus distribution versus transmission. You start to see sort of the, to your point, the complexity of trying to reconcile this is the goal this is the objective now how do we all interpret it so that we can all move towards that goal i think the biggest challenge to the threat is not so much that we don't understand the threat but can we move quickly enough and in, in, in sort of a, a not a lockstep but in sort of a steady step fashion so that all of us are you know raising the boats at the same time that's i think the struggle yeah, absolutely. Um, and Jamika, as a CISO, right, similar to Marshall, I'm sure those late night calls are nothing uh, that are foreign to you. I'd be interested to get your perspective, especially in relation to authentication and the work that your company does um, addressing threats. Absolutely. So I think one of the things that we've done really well is we're, we're we're really good at protecting the workforce and protecting our employees. But what what this new cyber strategy is saying, the accountability for protecting the consumer is also our responsibility. And I think at Okta, we really take that responsibility seriously. So what am I seeing in this space? Um, I like to call them my big three. We have a report called the State of Secure Identity. It's focused specifically on customer identity and access management, which is SIAM acronym. And what we're seeing in our big three is fraudulent registrations, which is actually going in and taking advantage of one-time use passwords, credentials, and, and actually aligning uh, those to the threat actor's intentions and doing fraudulent registrations. Credential stuffing, taking advantage of the identity idea that uh, users are uh, creatures of habit. Um, and so when you are able to compromise one set of credentials in one environment, you lift and shift those over to another environment. Credential stuffing is incredibly successful. It accounted for 30%, over 30% of logins um, within the first 90 days of 2022. We're seeing similar but higher numbers in 2023. And then finally, fraudulent uh, registrations, um, just focused around an MFA bypass. So both of those two together, focused around this idea that people get tired. Um, they have MFA fatigue and so they're starting to use lighter lighter vectors in that space. And so what are we actually doing about that? Because the accountability is on us. Really enabling use of, of frictionless um, access to consumer spaces. So what does that actually mean? Enabling CAPTCHA, enabling one-time passwords, biometrics are gonna be critically important. Um, enabling the use of frictionless login technologies in commercial spaces um, is really gonna be a big deal. And that's the work that we're doing. I think that the accountability is on big business to really be focused on um, protecting the consumer. And so that's the space that I'm really looking at right now. Um, my team is always busy. The nation state actors are pretty, uh, pretty thorough. Um, they're working together. And I think, 
you know, when I think about what are the organizations that are going to help us help us do this work, one of the reasons why you're not hearing about ransomware as much is because CISOs aren't disclosing it. And the reason that they're not disclosing it is because when we disclose, it's often punitive. We have to get away from this idea that it's punitive and understand that the collective is better than any one individual organization. And so when I think about working with organizations like Jen Easterly over at SUSE, they are making it so that things are not punitive for us. We're able to disclose. And one of the big things that's in the news right now is Dole. Dole is suffering from a pretty significant attack. And there should have been a rally cry of security professionals throughout industry to come and help Dole. Dole is critical infrastructure with our food. Um, and so this is something that it didn't rise to the heights of solar winds, but maybe it should have um, because it's critical infrastructure. That's a, good, that's a really good point. And I think it's a a good place for us to transition now to the new uh, cyber strategy that was published last week. Um, you know, before going into that, I think it's important for those that maybe didn't take that on as a reading uh, assignment over the weekend. Um, there are five key pillars um, in that report, right? The first one being defending critical infrastructure, uh, the second being disrupting and um, dismantling threat actors, the third being shaping um, market forces to drive security and resilience, um, and then also investing in a resilient future and forging international partnerships. Um, oh, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, to pursue shared goals, right? And so that is a vast, those pillars cover a lot of territory. Um, I think it will keep people busy for, for a long time, right? To consider challenges and things in that area. But I guess um, starting with you, Megan, I'd like to get your perspective on, you know, what did you think of the reports, right? What's in there that, you know, normally tracks with what you're looking at? What's not in there? What surprised you? I think your kind of first reaction. <laughs> Um, my first reaction was, I think it's bold in all the right ways. Um, it is carrying forward, as Catherine said, and others have said, the common messages and common best practices and, and common elements of prior strategies, but where I think we are finally, it took us longer than many of us would have liked to get here, um, we are finally to a place where we're talking honestly about incentives and the marketplace. Um, so I think that the things that most please me, uh, in addition to the incentives piece um, and thinking about giving a dual tracked approach of putting responsibility in the right place with regard to um, security and particularly thinking about software development, uh, but also hardware development, but also thinking about safe harbors. There are a lot of companies uh, that do the right thing and they shouldn't be penalized to your point um, for uh, having done the right thing and still fallen victim to to uh, the nation state actors. We, uh, as an organization that has been supportive and, and um, advocating for closer collaboration with uh, between industry and government are particularly thrilled um, with the disruption piece of this. Um, operational collaboration is something that we can do very well um, as, as partners, but we are still suffering from some limitations when it comes to scale and consistency. Uh, we still need to build capacity both within industry and government and between these two stakeholder groups, and really it's a much broader stakeholder set than that, uh, to do disruption, get information into the right hands, and, you know, not to sound too militaristic about this, but take the fight to the threat actors um, in, in close collaboration. It's not that we're, you know, doing everything and every second together. There are very good reasons why certain information doesn't leave certain places. But that shouldn't be the norm and that shouldn't be kind of the rule. And I think it's it's um, you know, particularly refreshing and, and uh, optimistic to see the administration take this idea on of saying, you know, at the bottom of the discussion around disruption, we're going to get through some of these administrative barriers because there is a will on both sides of this. Uh, it's not even an equation. It's the plus plus equals um, side of this. And we're, you know, where there's a will, we know that there's a way. So I'm... Um, I was pleased to see those aspects in particular. That's great. Now I like that, taking the, the fight to the threat actors. I think that's something we can all get behind. And Jimmy, what's your perspective on the strategy? I love the strategy. I think that the government is about the people. And because I'm an identity company, I'm like, we don't do technology just for the sake of technology. Identity is about um, the most important aspects of who we are as individuals. And so this is about the people for us. Um, and so, you know, to mandate zero trust architecture as one of the key tenants is critically important. What I think it also highlights is that, yes, there is a deeper need for public private partnership. There is a deeper need for accountability and where that sits at. But also, how are we actually going to get that done? I think one of the ways in which we do that is neutrality. Um, 
vendors have to work together. We have to have ways in which we can do uh, implement interoperability. Um, and so being neutral is gonna be, I think, a, a big part of how we actually do that implementation and how we hope to fuel that. Um, it's also how we're going to take accountability. When we have partnerships with other organizations across the board and different types of organizations, whether they're NGOs or whether they're um, in internet service providers or whether they're another vendor like us, I think it's gonna be critically important. That neutrality will allow us to look at our intelligence signals, look at threat postures and threat actors, and really allow us to build products that actually protect the people. And so I'm excited about the new executive order. That's great. No, that's really great to hear. I think, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think collaboration is, is really important and that interoperability is, is a well. Um, Catherine, what's your perspective? I, I, I listened to the conversation and I sort of feel like, you know, we're having this conversation on sort of a, a very strategic level and then we're having sort of on a more, you know, let's planning it kind of thing. And now we're at the tactical level, you know, and and it's sometimes, and I think for many people who follow this, you know, which layer are we talking about right now? So I'm going to talk not at the tactical level, uh, but one level up. Um, what I found uh, most encouraging about the cybersecurity strategy is, once again, it was very extensible from you know, work from way back when, you see NCI, PPD, you know, the Solarian Commission, and when they were talking about the operational collaboration. Now, you were clearly talking sort of like operational collaboration in terms of interoperability between systems or products or services. Cool, okay. Here I'm sort of talking about, you know, here's the interoperability or the collaboration between uh, entities who have visibility and capability in the cyberspace to work together to respond, to see, to address, as well as to be able to do that with government entities who also have visibility and capability. And we saw most of that work sort of kicked off in the, the CISIS Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. It's now been in play for well, more than a year. To, I, I'm lost track. Um, <laughs> Lumen is one of the Alliance members. And it's been fascinating to watch, you know, what does it mean to collaborate? Folks, I just want to tell you right now, yeah, we're on all the sort of the, 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 ch the channels in, in, in that environment. You know, it's quiet. It's quiet. But what's so amazing is to know that if something bubbles up, there are 22 companies on standby who are sort of monitoring, monitoring. Oh, I've got stuff there. I'm seeing that too. Come together, sort of figure it out. So this sort of, you know, it's a new practice at a higher level. It's not it's sort of like, you know, is it interoperable between, you know, Apple and Microsoft OSs and stuff like that. This is sort of the, I see this, can I contribute to solving this problem? I see that, can I contribute to solving this problem? And the fact that there's now a domain where one can do that uh, and not only work with, you know, some, you know, the most capable and agile entities, but also to be able to collaborate with government has been amazing. It was incredibly fruitful through the Russia-Ukraine for situational awareness. Uh, it was fruitful in terms of mitigating some of the issues that were happening overseas. And definitely um, one where I think we will continue to sort of build on those playbooks uh, as we move forward. And I think the interoperability that you're talking about and the interoperability that I'm talking about is the same because we're feeding signals at different levels. And so there's this there's this tactical level that feeds signals at upper levels. And so I'm talking about a more foundational um, interoperability, but I am also speaking to organizations like CISA where when we have that level of interoperability at a foundational base, we also have it at the higher levels. That's, enough. That's a great point. Marshall, from, from your perspective, right? What, stood out to you from the strategy? Yeah, so I'm just going to shift back to the tactical level for <laughs> maybe even like even yeah, more tactical. We're tactic. all keeping straight about where yeah, so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> So the two things I want to call out, the little pieces uh, of the strategy that I liked a lot. The first was the call out to support uh, modernizing the core internet protocols that drive a lot of how we communicate well, online cool. today. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the, the key pieces that call outs there was uh, the DNS system, which is just incredibly out of date. Mozilla, we've done a lot of work to build um, basically a more secure DNS system, what we call DOE or DNS over HTTPS. Um, and we have actually deployed that in the Firefox browser. That's been a very heavy lift for a variety of reasons. So if you're a Firefox user, your DNS queries when they leave your device are encrypted. Uh, for the rest of you, however, they're probably still leaving your device uh, in clear text. So good call out to switch your browser, um, but also why I think this focus on the underlying security protocols of the internet are really quite, quite critical. Uh, the other piece I want to call out is we mentioned earlier, uh, the software liability focus, which I am both uh, excited about, but also a little nervous about. 
I'm excited because I think this basic idea that companies need a stronger incentive uh, to build products securely is right. And so putting like a, a liability structure in place there, I think is a pretty sensible approach. The challenge, however, being, and like, I think everyone already knows this, all software has vulnerabilities. And so you need to create a safe harbor such that as long as you meet a, some baseline set of, of security controls, uh, if you meet that baseline set, you won't be, won't be liable. And then the challenge then is, okay, what's the baseline? And I think that's really gonna be a challenge. And like I said, it's gonna be easy to get wrong. Um, so for example, uh, Mozilla, we, we established the first private bug bounty program in the country almost 20 years ago. So that's a good, good indication. Like that's a pretty standard requirement. Everyone knows what it is. I think that's the type of thing that I would like to see in that safe harbor. Um, but the list will get longer and longer. <laughs> and as it gets longer, it gets more complex. And the more complex it gets, the more failure prone it's going to be. So we really need to set that threshold correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think as we, before we go into questions from the audience, I want to kind of look a little bit further forward, right? And get your perspectives on what might be on the horizon. Um, so Catherine, I'll, I'll start with you, you know, with this new strategy being released and, and in hand, you know, what are you looking forward to or thinking about um, trying to kind of drive forward with regard to Lumen or broader sector-wide efforts um, was on the horizon? Um, I think the two key elements, and you pinged on one of them um, in the strategy is the relook at the underlying internet protocols. Wow. That means we have to get the entire world to change, okay? So I, I know that the focus at sort of at an advisory level right now is gonna be what's the problem you wanna solve with DNS or Border Gateway Pro? What's the problem you wanna solve? Because these are gonna have to go through global standards to be able to be reconciled, put into computers and operating systems. Blah, 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 blah. So this is a big, big problem to be able to have a clear vision of what's the goal as we start to evolve these relatively old standards into something that's now next generation, um, that's going to that's going to require a lot of talk. And know, slightly more, you know, okay, we need to start moving on this now. Um, we're also just thinking very much about the post quantum environment. So if you haven't already started figuring out where all your data is and where that data lies and who, how much you care about it and what's currently encrypting it so that you can at some point, because it's a big yin yang between your vendors, your partners, your suppliers as to what is the, the, the quantum resistant you know, algorithm that's going to be using that you're going to have to put into your system. Well, you better start thinking about it now because uh, I think, you know, it's, it's better to be prepared and to know what you're up against. So we're all in sort of a pre sort of quantum 2K kind of mode. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your perspective <clears throat> from Okta on kind of what's on the horizon? What are you thinking about looking ahead for? Digital identity. And a digital identity, I don't know what happened. Okay, there we go. Digital identity, I think, is is the way of the future for us at Okta. We're looking at workforce. We have two clouds, workforce identity at cloud, which is focused on workforce employees. Customer identity cloud, focused on the consumer. Digital identity, I think, is the future. Um, and it really relates to more to the privacy of the consumer itself and their right to be forgotten. And so we're looking at that. We're looking at um, data sovereignty. We're looking at the ways in which we can um, enable identity to create those safe spaces for the consumer. And so digital identity is going to be big for us in the future. Um, it's what we're looking at. We're, we're doing a lot of research and understanding how technologies actually work together. Um, because I think this is something that we can't get out of the gate of. I'm, obviously, I work at a cloud native um, remote company. Um, we're way out there, but we also know that there are a lot of organizations that need to be brought along. And so we're not just thinking about it from the space of what's going to happen in the future, but we're also thinking about how do we help um, incremental change happen in organizations where they're not quite there yet? How do we look at DNS again? How do we, we're thinking about the past as well as the future, but we believe that digital identity, identity is one of those big investments that we have to make for the future and our investment in protecting it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's certainly a bedrock of things going forward. Uh, Megan, from the social, uh, sorry, civil society perspective, but also building upon, you talked about threat actors aren't going anywhere, right? A lot is, you know, continuing to happen and will continue to happen. What are you thinking about? What's IST doing um, looking ahead? Sure. Um, so we, we are continuing to implement the recommendations from the task force that we convened uh, almost two years ago now, and we'll stand by for more, but we'll have a, an event to, to talk about those um, the progress that's been achieved, um, hopefully in May. Um, but among the things that we're working at um, in that in the 
work of the task force is to look at hygiene. So we developed something called the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense, thinking about especially small and medium-sized enterprises, how can they better equip themselves to um, manage ransomware, um, probably when it happens, not if it happens. Um, we're also looking at what is, how is the ecosystem dealing with information? Uh, I think uh, you mentioned uh, CISOs are not reporting ransomware incidents. Why is that? And there are you know numbers of reasons, but uh, there is a lot of data out there about ransomware, but it's not getting in the right hands. And we can't really develop um, both uh, technologies and, and capabilities and from the consumer to the network level to withstand those incidents if we don't have the information. We also can't deploy instruments of, of national power and seek uh, to develop and, and deepen relationships internationally to manage those uh, incidents if we don't have the information. So we're trying to, to push forward on uh, digging deeper into the ecosystem and, and figuring out where those kind of still silos, unfortunately, of information reside and how we can better equip those who do have the information to share it appropriately. Um, in terms of uh, you know, the, both the strategy and um, another area that we're beginning to start some work in is around open source. So the strategy talks about um, the responsibility and the need for uh, renewed attention on, on software development, but particularly thinking about open source. And um, we are, we'll soon have a, a paper out talking about our, our kind of recommendations on where the open source uh, software security space is and where we think that there needs to be continued progress. Um, and the last thing I would say is that this, this idea of public-private collaboration really around operational collaboration. So not just sharing information, but let's take action based off of that information, respecting values, privacy, and civil liberties. Um, but as I said a few minutes ago, thinking about how we can not squabble amongst ourselves, but put that, take that squabble to the threat actors who are really pushing at that seam between um, industry and government, not only domestically, but if we think about the counter ransomware initiative, it's terrific. We have 35 countries plus the EU or 34 countries plus the EU. I can't remember the numbers. Um, that's a great coalition that's been built. And I know that the administration is keen to expand that, that um, coalition. Uh, they have a number of priorities, but including you know, policy issues. And, and in many cases, I think we're, we're on the, the kind of top level agreement around policy and the need to, to work between industry and government to reduce the risks from actors who operate from safe havens. But we also need to continue to build that trust that allows us to act on those common policy objectives. Absolutely. Marshall, what are your, your thoughts on the road ahead? Yeah, so just to maybe close out with one one gap that still concerns me. We talked about the executive order earlier. Um, one additional focus in that executive order uh, was on supply chain. Obviously, in the aftermath of the SolarWinds attack, there's a lot of focus on figuring out how we can sort of build a more robust supply chain. And I think there's still bigger gaps there that we need to be mindful of. The type of solutions that we've been exploring there and the solution space is just not very good. So the solutions tend to be very compliance heavy and process heavy, which I think in the end is not great and tells me that we don't have good technical so solutions there yet. And so I think I'd love for people to give more thinking to that, what the right set of solutions is that get beyond the sort of compliance burden uh, for a lot of a lot of companies. Because um, that's still, like I said, a big, a big gap. I think that executive order, what it did is made it more likely that when there is a compromise, it will be detected quickly and responded to. But I think it probably did the less of a good job of actually preventing an initial supply chain compromise in the first place, not for lack of effort and a lot of good thinking, but just because, like I said, the solution space is not great yet. That's, no, that's important. I think that's a good perspective um, and a good time for us to kind of pause here and see if our audience has any questions, take a, advantage of a great opportunity to get some insights from our thought leaders here. I'll open it up to you all. So he's quite there. Is there someone I'm not seeing back there? Can we go ahead and stand up? Where you get to the neighbors, talk a lot. Actually, uh, and Sunny sent out the DDS for a wonderful panel that was really well thought out to send the issue of the administration as we are out, you know, whether they can then feature cyber incidents. I think it's such a maturation, especially when they're looking at Joe, to tell this such a private sector and the land responsibilities that they carry in trying to help the consumer. Uh, I want to throw this a little bit out like the uh, you know, we have these issues around privacy, what it comes to worship really. We have questions up at the air in terms of you know, what happens when we don't have responsible governance uh, for what partners potentially you know, like, you know, up as our world, for instance. Um, how do you think that this might coincide if it was like identity access or, you know, you have centralized and lots of data that they so, like, do you have foreign nation states analyze the follower? I'll talk to you. Um, the case, I mean, 
gotten there yet? Do you think it's something to have to be able to focus on? I think I think we have gotten there. I think, you know, the way that we the legislation around data sovereignty and privacy isn't new. GDPR isn't new. And I think that when legislation is enacted that says that we must protect privacy, then that's the legislation that we have to follow. I think so for us as an organization that, that focuses on identity, our goals are the goals of the organizations that we support and that we build for. And so, and we're a global company, we do 40 to 50% of our business internationally. And so privacy isn't a new part of it. I think it is starting to be a consumer expectation one that we have to live up to. And so whatever it is, whatever organizations and companies that we support, we also have to support all the legislation around privacy that, that relates to the consumer. And so yes, we're thinking about it all the time because it's the same privacy that's violated in the way that you speak of. That's what the threat actors are looking for. They're looking for critical information around users. They're looking for social security numbers. They're looking for even IP addresses in many countries are uh, privacy, protected by privacy. And so it really is up to us to be thinking about about this and we are. And so we really want to make sure that the legislation around privacy, the laws around privacy, that we implement that into the design and the architecture of our products. And we are doing that. Um, again, identity is about people. It's not technology for the sake of technology. And so our number one goal is to protect the people that we serve. Okay. Yeah, do any of the vendors have any concern about the expansion of the concept of security uh, and cybersecurity beyond sort of uh, the technical sort of understanding on uh, the CIA, the uh, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability? And uh, now we see that, uh, you know, trade relations are being defined as national security, that we are trying to control and development of technology through export controls. Um, do you have any clear idea about where this leads or what the theoretical basis is based on in terms of its understanding of how national security is related to technological the businesses and develop? Yeah, I'm, I, I think it's interesting, the, the comment, because I think one challenge that I see is that cybersecurity is kind of everything security. <laughs> and what that means in practice on a day-to-day -day basis is like, it's easy to take your eye off the ball. So like, I think as a general matter, the expansion that you're describing is actually appropriate. Uh, cybersecurity is core to national security. But I think, as I mentioned at the outset, like how is it that the federal government didn't have basic security controls in place, right? Like someone took their eye off the ball at some point. We like to sort of talk very big and think very big about cybersecurity. Like I said, it seems to implicate everything. And I would love to see as we think big, we're also able to ex execute on a tactical level. Um, and if we're able to do that, then I think the breadth that you're describing is fine. If we're not, then we should narrow down and actually get some progress in the tactical areas. And I'm inclined to agree. I think, you know, right now we still have arms of the government globally who don't use multi-factor authentication. Um, and so when we look at this executive order, I'm looking at it at the base level. Um, I'm not looking at it to be evasive or to obfuscate information that should be available to the public. I'm looking at just the basics of protecting um, identity. Um, and this is just the, you know, when we think about what threat vectors and what attacks are effective, um, we're still, employees are still the number one threat vector and they're still the number one um, payload delivery. And, and, and a lot of that can be be um, protected by multi-factor authentication, which we still don't have widely deployed. And so I think you're thinking, you know, to your point, you're thinking super high level around um, our ability to make information available. And we're looking at the base level of just get these base level controls in place. That's where we are right now. We're, we're looking at a policy that says, let's get these base level vector of security controls in place. I think, yes, as we grow, this is something that should be of concern, but right now we're just not there. It's still, you know, really, really basic rudimentary cybersecurity. So well, as one to follow up on this, um, if you're already in an environment where we have gone from sort of, we're using cyber for cool things to we use cyber to run everything and if the nation as a whole, government, you know, as a leader, a representative, if you will, sort of isn't still sort of doing the basics thing, then we have put ourselves in a position where our cybersecurity practices undermine our ability to do business, to do whatever it is we do. And if we have not paid enough attention to doing the fundamental core things that make our company whatever makes it important, whether power or whatever, 
if we haven't done those basic things and we're undermining our economic security, and if our economic security is undermined because power things go down or another colonial explodes or there's another big you know, problem with you know, one of the major operating systems, then we as a nation are in an undermined position and therefore that impacts our national security. So I see the string, but to their points, you know, you have to start with, did you lock the door? And is us though in this question of you know how, is there an end to this or is it is it everything is um, the values that we ascribe to and have coalition partners who share those values um, so where where the United States and its partners are thinking about implementing core principles of of security to advance economic security our the value there is is around individual privacy and security in the national security sense for the United States and its partners is not about regime stability in the sense that the authoritarian countries think about it. Um, so the values that we articulate as Western countries and as partner nations, I think, is is one of the key disti distinctions between a trade policy that, that might be coming from, from other parties at the table who um, can may say the same thing, but don't have the same meaning behind it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Rishi Ashka from Fantasism. Uh, so, the, the previous time we this, this book was about a AI rhythm in the sand of Japan, the, the metaverse came up. Um, <clears throat> so, so, my question is with all of those uh, fleets technologies and the technologies, how does, how does uh, that get back? How do you think about cybersecurity and how is the kind of regulation of those technologies interact with cybersecurity uh, regulation of that and what issues these would actually just give us? Okay, first, <laughs> Well, I think it's, I mean, I, I as a, I'm excited about AI um, and machine learning technologies, but I also worry. Um, I think worry is an innate state of a CISO. And so, you know, that's just a, a part of my my fiber of who I am. Um, I worry because with every new technology, there's the threat actor is always thinking as much as we are thinking about using it. And so I worry that we will not get ahead of the awareness around um, what can be done with AI. I worry about source code being dropped there. I worry about its ability to code very quickly and very accurately. So I worry in that space that that will become another threat, uh, another vector for threat actors to deliver payloads and to deliver information, um, to deliver um, into our code and into our by design process um, payloads that potentially could turn into solar winds or Stuxnet. I, I do worry, but I also believe that it is our job while we worry to also to continue to drive innovation. Um, and so for us, ChatGPT is one of our new customers um, and they are flexing our engineering team in an incredible way that will enable innovation through the login box. Um, and so while I am worried, I'm also balancing that with this idea that the greater good is so much more important. Um, and so, yes, I worry, but I worry in the same way that I worry at some point, um, our, our CIC, our Auth0 technology was also the thing that people worried about. Um, and, and then we came in very quickly and said, no, we're gonna shore up security for it. I think we have to do the same. If we don't, it will become, you know, and I, and I hate to use this example, but it's a great example. People really loved that Bitcoin was unregulated. They loved it until they didn't. Um, and now the fact that it was unregulated and uninsured has become a really big problem for citizens globally. We don't want chat GPT to be the next FTX, we don't. And so if we don't want that to happen, we have to engage early, often, and make sure that it doesn't become our next big, big threat vector. So I'm excited about it, but I also know that there's a right level of worry around security to your point. I think you know, one of the points that's that's uh, both articulated in the strategy and I think also in the speech that Director Easterly gave at, at Carnegie Mellon last week is this idea of, um, you know, where do we, where do we advance security around these new technologies are we are we as as both civil society industry and governments at those conversations around the standards development organizations and i think you know unfortunately i fear it, i worry that we are now uh getting paying it back a little so we're, we're coming from a, a deficit but what what i heard in the strategy and and in director Ishley's speech last week was really kind of encouraging again uh, industry to come and and regain the kind of leadership role in the standards development organizations again to articulate a number of things including the values that that we are building into uh, companies and harnessing uh, those values and, and advancing innovation that that is 
actually consumer centric and and privacy and security uh, facing. Can I just jump in quickly on this? I'll just say, like, I I really appreciate these comments. The the contrast to uh, cryptocurrency, and I think, is interesting though, because I will highlight. Sorry, just to be a little sharp at the moment, like. Blockchain's kind of a useless technology. And so when the market there collapsed, the, the potential implications were fairly contained. This technology that we're talking about here, well, it's it's still very immature and it's, I think, actually pretty far from being productized in a, in a meaningful way. It's going to touch everything eventually. And exactly what that means for our jobs and everybody's jobs, I think, is going to be really dynamic. And I'm sure we'll have some interesting implications for our job, just like everybody else, because I think the technology is pretty remarkable. Some Mike Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. 30 years ago, I started working on encryption policy. It's even more screwed up now than it was in the Clinton administration. And the main reason is because of my favorite hashtag, when policies collide. We've got three different agencies all pulling in very different directions. And we have the same situation in India, the same situation in the UK. We have a similar problem with vulnerability disclosure. Cybersecurity people like you want to know where the problems are. Certain other agencies want to be able to exploit them. So my two-part question for anybody that wants to answer this, is there any country that's actually going to resolve this collision of policies? And if there is one, tell me who it is and whether they'll do it right or not. It's an easy question. <laughs> um, no one wants to take that on. I think it's an interesting question. It's interesting that you say it's worse now than it was before. I actually think in the States we've made more progress. And actually the challenge I see globally is that we haven't seen it. You, we've had a very robust debate here for a long time. And that hasn't landed in any particular sort of statutory framework. But I think there's sort of this detente at this point where everyone's like, you know, actually, cybersecurity world is kind of a mess. We're going to be pro-encryption. That's, I think, and in practice, I think, where we've landed. That's not the case the case globally. Um, the, um, the vulnerability disclosure piece is a little trickier. I also think there was progress there almost four years ago. Um, and with sort of the, 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 the VEP, the vulnerabilities equities process started to mature. Um, and now it seems to have receded a little bit. And I think there's probably, if we sort of look under the hood and look at what's really happening in government, I suspect there's some, been some backstepping there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that the UN had the, um, their cyber stability conference last Friday, right? And there was a lot of discussion, not so much about vulnerability disclosure, but about attribution, which is also one of those really hard topics. And you kind of think about the dichotomies that you spoke to around, um, you know, people trying to exploit vulnerabilities, people wanting to understand what those vulnerabilities and what they mean for their organization. Um, so I think that there's a lot of tension around these topics that, you know, if, to your question around a front emerging, right? I think that's a pretty, um, you know, difficult proposition to try to read the, the tea leaves there. Um, but it's something that I think the industry collectively is cognizant of and trying to work through, but also have some wins in other spaces, including some spaces identified in the cybersecurity strategy, for example. Um, I think there was one more question. You'll be our last question. Mr. Uh, what do you feel a little bit more? Or talk about global coordination of national strategy on state level legislation private sector responsibilities to protect the individual consumers and using infrastructure or organizations working out at this level. So that, what is the expectation for building local government, specifically local law enforcement capacity to engage in cybersecurity defenses? Um, and if it's not possible, you know, why should we get up on that particular aspect of this cybersecurity defense attract? I can take a, a quick stab at that. Um... One, there is a state, local, tribal, territorial government coordinating council that we do get to hang out with a little bit. Um, uh, what, what we increasingly see as industry, the critical infrastructure sectors, is increasingly, you know, um, the the desire and the ability and the willingness for federal goals to be manifested in grants, monies, whatever, which end up being administered at the state. Uh, which end up harmonizing some of the um, 
whether it's resiliency goals or cybersecurity goals in not only their own state level or local level infrastructure, but also some of the infrastructures in that area. Certainly the broadband grant program is a, you know, a poster child for that. Um, where, where I think the frustration lies is that, and it's, and it's a frustration shared by virtually every company on earth, unless you were, you know, someone the size of Google or something like that, is that, you know, it's not your normal job. <laughs> this is not your normal job. And so I, I think what we're increasingly seeing, and I think it's, it's teased out uh, certainly in the Solarian Commission as well as in the strategy, the idea that, you know, that those who have the capability need to make it as streamlined and as easy as possible to be able to um, either, you know, lock down the K through 12 systems or alternatively to be able to have the local county police understand that, know that data center around the corner is really important. And if you see weird, weird things in an area, you know, you might want to answer the call quickly. We are seeing that extensibility, that, that going deep increasingly. Are we there yet? No, no. But the fact that we're seeing it, we're seeing it manifested in exercises, we're seeing it exercise in grant programs is in my mind, huge progress. I would add that this new strategy is one that can be adopted at the federal, state, and local level. It's not um, one of those strategies that is so granular that nobody can figure out how to do it. These are, are simple, high level, uh, not even high level, these are simple foundational um, recommendations around how cybersecurity can be implemented, how data can be protected, how it can be encrypted at rest, how it can be, like these are really simple. And so for a federal, state, or local government, multi-factor authentication, zero trust, these are things that everyone should be thinking about for the future. And so federal, state, and local governments shouldn't feel like this is too hard for them. This is, a, this is the type of strategy that will allow for a leader follower model. And I think this is one that we should really take a look at and say they've got it right at the federal level. And so this is one that we should follow. Uh, Maurice, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Craig Newmark, the philanthropist, has stood up something called the cyber civil defense. And so he's looking at, you know, equipping uh, civil society, largely uh, nonprofits, to better secure themselves and, and supporting us and a number of other nonprofits and helping to kind of push security down to the local level. Uh, where I think we still need to, to, to evolve is the point that you made. One of the points that you made, local law enforcement is still not um, in the position it needs to be. And I think we do have a bit of, uh, I think Director Easterly and, and uh, her predecessor, Chris Krebs, would say CISA's role is in the field. Um, and it really needs to be CISA and uh, you know FBI working with its local partners to bring the defensive narrative to the local level and think about how we can build the capacity of local law enforcement together with their CISA partners, you know, we, we, we need to be in a place where we are with natural disasters. Um, you know, FEMA knows what to do and probably everybody here knows, I live in a hurricane region, what I need to be doing to get ready. Um, we, we still have a little bit of ways to go. Um, and there are, you know, there are things that we can get in, and there are capabilities that, that consumers and locals can use, but we still need to get it in their hands and, and have them be able to maintain it. That's great. Now, something certainly to work on. Um, well, I think we're st we're standing now between you guys and, and lunch. Um, I want to thank our panelists. I think this great discussion. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for attending.